summer of '69. Yes. Um, you talked to Brian Adams about that song, didn't you? You've met him. And I've met him a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't actually tell him I was going to do it on the album. Um, I told him I was going to do it better than he did on the album. Or no, that was a joke. That was a joke. I didn't, I didn't. Um, no, but it's a great nod to what to what a great artist he is and what a wonderful song he is. And he did give you some backstory to the creation of the song as well, didn't he? Remember, we are in a church, so... Yes, <laughs> you did. Sanitised version of the story. Yeah, I can't, I can't quite... I'm not sure if I should go into this real story of the song, to be honest. You put me on the spot there, Craig. Um, but it isn't about the year 1969. <laughs> That's what you were. Um, remember, we are in a church, which is why Alfie's going to be singing Living on a Prayer. That's a hymn, right? It is, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So Every Sunday. Got the memo. Yes, I did. Okay, thank you. Um, the second track you played there, Open Arms, is obviously the title track from the record, uh, which uh, I knew that song. I don't know how many of your regular fans may have known that song, but do you want to explain the who knew yeah. Open Arms? Yeah. Are you Journey fans? Yeah. Okay. Why didn't you do Don't Stop Believing? Sorry? Why didn't you do Don't Stop Believing? It's been done so many That's times. Yes. No, it's been done to death. But I mean, I think, I think that for me, there was, a, there was a couple actually that were um, on the list of the journey tracks to do. One was uh, Open Arms and the other one was Faithfully, um, which is, a, again, a tremendous song, but they're very similar. Um, and we went for Open Arms on this one, and then who knows what might do Faithfully on the next day. I mean, Steve Perry, the journey singer, he's got a very high singing voice. Yeah. How did you approach that song differently given your vocal skills? I dropped the key. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, his, his voice is, ridiculously high and he can sit right on the top in, the, in that beautiful sweet spot that he has um, but sustaining that um, full voice for me as an opera singer um, is quite taxing and can work the voice out very quickly so if I'm doing a tour like I was um, you know and I've got 22 shows to do sitting on the top of the if my voice isn't actually the same as Steve's, you know, he's, he's a very different singer than me, obviously, and his voice is in a very different place. But for myself, being a classical singer and having that structure, powering the sound out the way I do, um, would just wear me out. I'll probably get through three or four shows and then not have a voice. <laughs> you know, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're obviously all deep fans of Alfie. Were you expecting them to do a, a hard rock album? Yes! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Was it about time too? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. I mean, I know you, you've, you had this thought about doing a record like this is when you were in New York on La Boheme, right? Yeah, I mean, that was 20 odd years ago now. Um, Baz really sort of, uh, Baz Luhrmann um, sort of gave me the, a little bit of the idea because I had the, I had the thought of doing, that, doing an album like this back then. And then I saw Baz putting contemporary songs to classical movies that he did, like Romeo and Juliet, all about contemporary music in there, and it was fabulous. So I thought, well, if the movie scene can do it, then surely the recording scene can, we can as well, you know, so, and, and in all honesty, it's been, you know, it's been happening for years, but without the recognition of it, you know, when you think of, like, bands like Pink Floyd and Genesis and Led Zeppelin, you know, they all brought on string players to you know, to accompany themselves, even the Beatles, you know, and, and all that, you know, so um, it, it is something that's not new, but putting my own vocal to this and bringing out songs like the ones that were, that were on the album, um, I wanted to really show the beauty of them, the, uh, how romantic these songs are, but also, you know, fundamentally I wanted to show the, the, the collaboration between contemporary music and really, really spell it out with the classical structure of the orchestra. So bringing the two together, for me, has never been an issue. Getting people to believe in that was another problem. But when, when you are with a great management company and a wonderful record label, they believe in you and they give you the license to, to fulfill your dreams. You've got a deep love of rock music and a big rock music collection and there's hundreds of cl classic rock anthems you could have chosen. How did you drill down into the songs you actually wanted to include on the record? That was, that was difficult because, you know, there was, I mean, hundreds on the list that we could have chosen. 
But I think for this album in particular, I really wanted to put songs out there that everybody knew, that everybody could sing along with, but not just know, but could also like um, remember the times when they first heard that song, like Summer of 69, like Living on a Prayer, you know, and, and, and think back to maybe the childhood and the good old memories, good old times and things like that. So I wanted to stimulate the senses in that way as well as uh, sing really good music. And did you have a, a lyrical criteria for some of the songs? Did you want the songs to mean something in terms of the messages they were given and the, and the words you were going to be singing too? I think uh, with every song that I sing, every song in my repertoire, I have to connect with it lyrically. Um, you know, so I find something in that song that I can connect with. Um, and if I can't connect with it, I, I make it up. <laughs> uh, I mean, on that point, Here I Go Again by, by Whitesnake seems to be particularly pertinent to you. Yeah, yeah, because I'm not singing with Michael Ball. So. <laughs> well, that's why you're always here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. He's stuck in. The security have been told to keep him out, so don't worry. He will not be here tonight. <laughs> Banned from every church in South London, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> No, you know, I mean, it is, it is quite poignant for me, I suppose, because, you know, I have sort of uh, gone through a wonderful relationship with my ex-wife. We had a wonderful marriage. I hate to say, people will always say, you know, I'm sorry, your marriage failed. It didn't fail. It just, it ran its course. But, you know, people go through that. I'm not the only one. And, um, yeah, um, but I'm, no, I'm never on my own, really. When I think about it, I've got so many friends. My children are still there. My ex-wife is still there. I have wonderful colleagues on stage. These, these people, of course. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, for the for the whole of the, the run of the tour, the theatres were full, and I, I can't thank you all enough for, for coming. You know, I really yeah. appreciate that so much from the bottom of my heart. I really do. Did anyone make it show us on the tour? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is it up there with his best tour? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thumb, two thumbs up from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how was it performing with the band on tour and digging into these big rock songs? It was fabulous. It was great because, you know, it was different every night. There was always something new on stage that we were, um, we were, we were pulling out the bag, you know, the guys. And the, what, what I, you know, the thing I liked about the tour was, was the fact that the guys on stage really showed their personalities too. It wasn't just about me up front and them behind. I really wanted them to shine and to show everybody what wonderful guys they are, including my backing singers as well. They, they got, in, got down to the front and did a couple of numbers. And it was, it was wonderful to have that because it really makes you feel like you really have a band. I've always wanted to be the lead singer of a band. I've never really wanted to do the solo thing I've always wanted to be a lead singer of a rock band, and that's it. so having that opportunity with these guys, it really, really was wonderful. Yeah, I saw the tour in Edinburgh, and I could see how helpful the band were. They actually helped him off the floor when he went down to do a Freddie Mercury lunch. <laughs> you couldn't get back up on your own, could you? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> These went. <laughs> it was all those jumps that I was doing. <laughs> But the, rep, the, the set list was fantastic because it, it drew from the Italian crooner tradition, some of your opera stuff, some of your musical theatre and some of the rock songs. How did you go about picking a set when you've got so many different iterations of your career so far? Well, that, that was it, really. I mean, we, we knew that we couldn't really fit it into a 90-minute show, into an hour and a half. Because normally I would have had a support act that would have gone on and done, say, 30 minutes or something, and then... I would have come on and done a 90 minute show. Um, and I didn't want to do that this time. I wanted to do, I wanted the whole evening to myself. It's probably a little selfish, but um, I wanted to do that. So I did the show in two halves. I did uh, just, uh, um, I think it was about an hour for the first half and then an hour and a half for the second. So it was two and a half hours of singing and it was tough, but it was great. Every single night was fabulous and I loved it. And um, yeah, it was. Uh, It was really nice to be able to go through that journey of my operatic world through to the, you know, my folk, Italian, Neapolitan stuff into my, um, my own original music as well, which um, I'm pleased about. And the musical theatre time with Les Mis and, and, uh, and then into this, where I am now. The show was a proper journey through your career, but it was also a journey into your past, into your family's past. 
you pay tribute to the songs that you and your brothers and sisters loved growing up that particularly you heard your dad, for example, singing. Would you mind telling us about how you got that song selection together and, and picked the songs that you did pick? Yeah, I, I come from a family of uh, nine children, so I'm the youngest of nine kids. And um, we have this uh, WhatsApp group um, What's it called? It's, uh, it's called Mum's Update. It's simple as that. It's just how my mum's doing, you know. Um, and she's still trucking on. She's amazing. She's like 92 this year and um, yeah. still fighting fit. It's crazy. Um, so we have a, we have a daily uh, chat group. And, and, um, and I, I said to them, can you all send me a song that reminds you of your childhood, that reminds you of growing up? 75 Shakespeare Road in Fleetwood, you know. And so they all sent me a huge list of songs that, that, that I've heard my dad sing around the house all the time. And I thought, how are we gonna, there's some great tracks here. There's a track by Lonnie Donegan that I wanna do. There's a track by Jim Reeves, Slim Whitman, Roy Orbison, all these, all these beautiful songs. And I thought, let's do a full medley. And that would have taken the first half of it. <laughs> it would have been the first half of the show. So I thought, look, you know what, let's, let's try a few together. We tried to blend a few, and then in rehearsals we thought, let's just do one really cool hit that my dad used to sing all the time and, uh, and just do it in, its all, in all its glory. And we did. We sang Jack to a King, which was a, a cracking song. Really cool. Always put a smile on my face. The audience loved it, sing too, and they were smiling and dancing away and singing along as well. And in, in the set, you, you segued from that into Bring Him Home and then a song you wrote yourself for your father. Yeah, it was the, the other way around actually. After, after I sang Jack to a King, I went into talking a bit more about my dad and then uh, sang this song called Father that, um, uh, I'm, you know, that I wrote with a friend of mine, Leon Stanford. He's, a great singer-songwriter. And I just sat, remember, telling him the story about my dad and uh, talking him through everything and, and what he was like and what he used to do for me. And he came back the following day and he said, I've got an idea for a song, Alf. I just want to play you, th play you through it. And he did. And uh, everything just hit home. All the lyrics just hit home. And, um, and yeah, that, I sang that. And this, the, the last line of that song is, I'll keep singing, bring him home until we're there. So the last sort of accompaniment that Murray was playing on guitar went perfectly into the intro of Lane's of uh, Bring Him Home. So we just blended the two songs and it worked perfectly. It was a lovely little moment. It's a good moment in the set, wasn't it? Beautiful. Um, you've been very busy the last year and a half, but you've also attempted to write this book. Everyone's got this out, already yep. checked that video. There will be questions about the contents of this book later. Um, it's a deeply personal book. It's a deeply honest book. Yeah. Um, you discuss some pretty difficult things in there, you know, and full credit to you for doing that. It's an absolutely captivating uh, read. Why did you want to go so deep and so nakedly honest in this memoir? Um, I think there was a, it was, it was sort of in a number of stages, really. I mean, throughout, you know, when, when things, went south with my, with my uh, marriage, you know, and, and, and it, it broke down. Um, it was a difficult road that I was treading to try and get myself back on my feet and, and back in a place where I had confidence and, you know, was happy with my own company and that sort of thing. Um, and I was sort of volunteering for everything I possibly could. You know, I was saying, <laughs> there's a movie with Jim Carrey and it's called Yes Man. You know, and I just thought, I'm going to start doing that. I'm just going to start saying yes to all the chances and all the opportunities that cross my path. And um, and so I did, you know. And it was it was coming to the end of COVID, and one opportunity came about to, for me to take part in the TV show Freeze the Fear, um, where I had to subject myself to cold water therapy and. Uh, sitting in frozen lakes in the Alps in the middle of January. Everyone watch this show? Yeah. Yeah. He was freezing his bollocks off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Revealing in more ways than one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I went in the water quite confident, and then I came out a bit shy. <laughs> 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 but it was cool. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the thing, you know, the thing that I, that I loved about that show as well was one um, challenge that we had to do was we had to swim under the ice. You know, and there was like two. Uh, there was a, the first hole that you had to jump in, and then you had to swim to one hole and then swim further to another to another hole. And I, and I didn't really have any fear about this. And I, I, I was I was okay because I felt like it was a really cool opportunity for me to, in a way, leave all the stress and the anxiety and the troubles and the trauma and the mistakes and everything behind me under the ice. Um, and um, now that it's melted, I have no idea where they are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was it was you know. Visually, that was what I wanted to try and achieve, and I, I did. When I when I got out of the second hole that they put, um, I felt this huge release of, of, of worry, of tension, of upset, and um, I felt confident. And I felt like I've really done this. This is great. I can I can move on in a positive way, and. Um, and so I, I did, and then I woke up and realised I had to bungee jump off a bridge, which is <laughs> not a, again, not, a, not a, a scary thing. But that, that was like, uh, again, something that I, I needed to do because I felt like I, there, was still, there was still stuff there that I had to release. So when I jumped off and fell and swung, into, swung under the bridge, it was like, as Wim Hof used to said to me all the time, it's like swim, swinging into the future, swinging into the future, and into your oncoming days and into something new, swinging into something new. And, and so I had that in my mind as well, and that felt great. I felt confident after doing that, and I'll never do it again. <laughs> it, was, it was lovely. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't lovely. <laughs> Um, I did well, it unlocked something in you, and, and hence the book, and hence, yes. I guess, the boldness of this, this musical project, as well as another new chapter for you. Yeah. Um, we've got another couple of songs coming up now. Um, the first one, a Chris Isaac classic. Yeah. Now, I think you sat next to him on a plane once, you ignored him. I, I, no, he didn't ignore me, actually. He's okay. a really, no, he's a, really, he's a really sweet guy. I um, had been to see him in uh, Salt Lake City. He'd been playing this... Um, show at uh, a place called Redview Gardens, which is beautiful, outdoor venue. And um, he got on a plane, I was uh, literally was on the same plane as him the following day to uh, San Diego. And uh, um, I knew the tour manager, I can't remember why, but the tour manager, we, we started talking and that was it. We, she knew me because I knew people at the venue of Red Butte Gun. So she said, look, um, when we've taken off and it's all settled, I'll come and get you and bring you up to see um, Chris. And uh, so I thought, wow, this is, this is great. This is wonderful. Thank you. And um, so she came and got me. I went to the front and uh, to the, the plane in the first class area and I stood by the side of him. And I said, hello, Mr. Isaac. Okay, and he said, uh, can you have a gin and tonic, please? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I said, I'll get it for you, no problem. <laughs> uh, and we had a lovely chat, really, really sweet guy. And I've always been a fan of him, of his uh, music, and him as a person, because he's very humorous on stage, he doesn't take himself too serious. He uh, is a lovely family man as well, and a great musician, great songwriter. And uh, yeah, I've always been a fan. So you're, you're doing Wicked Game, but I believe that at one point that slot in the album was going to be filled by Motley Crue. <laughs> it was, yeah. There was a, there was a Motley Crue song called um, Home Sweet Home, and it's a, it's a great track, um, but, but when we looked at the song and we tried it in the studio, um, the only bit of the song that you really hook onto is the chorus, is the bit that goes, Home Sweet Home. It's that, it's that, that's the only hook, and so the rest of it's rubbish. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's a great song, but um, um, we thought, you know, let's let's get a song that is really well known, really beautiful, great lyrics, great melody, 
and we'll substitute it for that. So that's what we did. And, may, and maybe with the Motley Crue song, it's a better song, I think, um, live than it is personally for myself on an album. And this one was perfect, live and on an album. So there's lots of uh, classic by big rock bands on the, the record. And then we've also got Run by Snow Patrol, not so much of a big rock band. But a classic, classic song yeah. by your friend Gary Lightbody. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, uh, I've been singing this song for a very long time, singing run for, for a long time. The first time I did it, I sang it for the 70th anniversary of the uh, VE Day. Uh, VE Day. And um, um, I've sung it in every concert ever since, really. But I've never had the opportunity to record it. And this album, gave me that opportunity. So, um, you know, I told Gary I was doing it, he was thrilled. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm proud that it's on there, finally. Brilliant. Well, let's get the lads back on, okay. shall we? And we'll do another two songs. Oh,